Welcome to the Clarence Church of Christ online worship experience. If you're a regular viewer, welcome. If you're a new viewer, welcome, and we invite you to click or tap the subscribe button to our channel. Feel free to leave a comment or question below. You can also check us out at clarencecc.org or at Clarence CFC on Facebook and Instagram. We're glad you're joining us today to worship. Good morning. Welcome to the Clarence Church of Christ. We're so glad you're here with us this morning, finally worshiping inside. This is nice. You can see all your faces up close. You don't have to stand and worship with us since we don't have the words up, so hopefully you enjoy uh, the music of being sang to you this morning. If you know it, just sing along. Good morning. 
Happy to see you here this morning. It was approximately 516 BC, give or take a couple of years maybe, and it was a good day in Jerusalem. The people were gathered to celebrate the rebuilt temple. I'm going to read to you from Ezra chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. It describes a little bit about that day. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God, 
100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats according to the number of the tribes of Israel. They had a lot to celebrate. They had returned to the land after about 70 years of exile and captivity in Babylon. Some people in the crowd remembered the old temple, the original one that had been built by Solomon. Today, we have reason to celebrate. After about three months of COVID-19 lockdown, some of us at least are able to be here to worship together inside the building again. Those who aren't are hopefully following along at home because we're experimenting with live streaming this morning. However, no matter how important, no, no matter how precious, no matter how meaningful this building is for many of us, and it is, it's important to remember God is not limited by nor confined within these walls. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is so good to be here today to worship you. Um, it is good for all of us, whether here or not able to be here this morning. Father, we, we ask for your blessings of uh, love and peace and health on all of us as we go through these times. And we pray that in these times of uh, uh, poorly understood illness and, and uh, danger and turmoil in our society, that people would be, they would be guided by the way that we live, that by the way that we live our lives and shine the light of the gospel to our community. They would be turned to you Father, we pray that you would help us as we try to take this message to our our neighborhoods and our families and our community. And again, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
and definitely not joy, apparently. Some things have never changed. Nobody is in these front seats. What's the issue? Hopefully you can hear me. I'll try to you have a Bible with you or on your phone or something like that and would like to follow along, we're going to be in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. About food sacrifice to idols. We know that we are, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then about eating food sacrifice to idols. We know what an idol, we know that an idol is nothing at all. Gods, gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as in when you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. We join. What we are short of is a way for our facts, data, and knowledge to not bring harm to each other. We are short of a way to have community with each other amidst this time. We are short of being able to have relationship with each other as God's sons and daughters, despite our different knowledge bases. If we reflect on the cultural era in which we live, it's not hard to start noticing that facts are given one of the highest values in our culture. We often assume that facts are the final arbiter of what we do and what we choose to do. COVID-19 has just highlighted this further. Look at the facts, look at the graphs, look at the science, look at the information. And magically, everyone will somehow see the facts, graphs, science, and information from the same perspective. At which point you may now be laughing to yourself inside because you know functionally that people don't see facts, graphs, science, and information all from the same perspective. We all come from different backgrounds, from different stories, from different experiences, and that impacts how we perceive those facts, graphs, and data. But because we're all raised in an environment that believes that facts are one of the highest values, we often assume everyone sees the facts the way we do. However, when we look at the life and teachings of Jesus, we don't see facts as one of the highest values for what he chooses and does. Facts do matter to Jesus. Don't hear me wrong in that. They do matter, but they aren't the most important thing, it seems to him. Rather, in the life and teachings of Jesus, we see that love is what is most important. Love is what determines what Jesus does with the knowledge that he has. The love of Jesus determines what we do with the knowledge that we have. The love of Jesus determines what we do with the knowledge that we have. 1 Corinthians 8 places us within this uh, situation. The church in Corinth is surrounded by religions that offer uh, meat, the meat of animals as a sacrifice to various different gods. And as these religions were often part of the surrounding culture, just as uh, Hinduism is to India, is to them, was just part of their culture. Like, it was almost hard to, to be a Corinthian and to not be a part of those things. It was just part of being part of the faithful to Jesus. Their, their faithfulness to Jesus isn't really in question here. It's, but they still have these facts and knowledge that they're ready to kind of say, no, this is why we need to do this this way. The Apostle Paul addresses this situation by pointing out that knowledge is not the defining factor for what a follower of Jesus chooses or does. The Apostle Paul notes that knowledge puffs up a person, which causes them to be over and against other people, causes them to be superior. Verse 2 is key to the thrust of what Paul is conveying in this passage, where he says, Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. He's not saying they don't know anything, but he's saying the way you use your knowledge isn't the way you're supposed to be using it. You have knowledge, but you're not using it in the way in which Jesus would have us use it. In other words, knowledge is important, but the way in which you use knowledge matters more. Knowledge is important, but the way in which you use that knowledge matters a lot more. Ultimately, the Apostle Paul points to the way of Jesus. Specifically, the agape love way. If anyone had the knowledge and facts at their disposal, I mean, Jesus had that, right? If anyone had the knowledge and the facts ready to go, it was Jesus, the creator of all things. But the higher determining factor for what Jesus chose and did was love. Jesus utilized the facts and knowledge of himself to be, which determines what we do with the knowledge that we have. The love of Jesus determines what we do with the knowledge that we have. While we are not facing a situation where we are called to maintain relationship with each other amidst differing conclusions regarding meat sacrifice to idols or false gods, 
we are facing a situation where we are called to maintain a relationship with each other amidst differing conclusions about how to deal with COVID-19, amidst other issues such as policing and discrimination. As I read the Apostle Paul's wording to the church in Corinth, he doesn't focus on the facts, the data, or the knowledge base that each group is working from, but he does focus on how they use those facts and that data and that knowledge base. In our current situation in 2020, you might have facts that everyone should be wearing a mask in every situation outside of their home. You might have facts that everyone should be able to make responsible choices in all circumstances and not have the government mandate what responsibility people should be taking. But for either side, flaunting the data and facts over and against another person, shaming or strong-arming them to see the facts and data the way we do is not the way of Jesus. That way is not allowing the knowledge you have to be guided by the love of Jesus. Later in his letter, possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That one part really sticks out, at least to me. If I have all knowledge, but I do not have love, I am nothing. Shay is going to help me with something here in a moment. I'll tell you to start. So my son, and you've maybe heard him already this morning, my youngest one, Towns, for whatever reason, decides that just screaming at random times is like his thing to do now. So whether it's in the car, whether it's in public, it doesn't matter. I mean, he just screams like a pterodactyl, and it's like there's no stopping it. Like nothing we try seems to get him to stop. He just thinks it's funnier and just keeps doing it, and it's just like anything that's going on around you, you can't understand anything because it's just like, ah! like non-stop he can probably demonstrate for you here later okay go ahead but it's probably like this in our culture wear a mask confident person Every time we use knowledge toward another without love, I think it sounds like this. It just sounds like this obnoxious noise. It sounds like my son going, ah, all the time. <laughs> Sorry if your eardrums just pop there. But I think that's Paul's point. Like, when we talk in a way or use facts and data and knowledge in a way that's not trying to uh, build up or strengthen the other person, no matter where they're starting from or we're starting from, it just sounds unhelpful. It doesn't add life. It doesn't build up the other person. It just sounds like an unbearable sound. The love of Jesus determines what we do with knowledge. The love of Jesus determines what we do with knowledge. Today, I simply want to invite you to affirm that with me, that we are called to allow the love of Jesus to determine what we do with the knowledge that we have. I invite you to affirm that we are called to allow the love of Jesus to determine what we do with the knowledge that we have. Without the love of Jesus, our knowledge is worthless and unbearable to hear and hard for others to comprehend. The love of Jesus determines what we do with knowledge. The love of Jesus determines what we do with knowledge. Would you join me in prayer as we close? Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to us a world in which there are facts and knowledge and data and reason and all the things that make, make it possible for us to comprehend the life that you've given us to live. Father, lead us and guide us by your spirit and in your love to uh, consider others, to build each other up, to encourage each other, to reach down to each other's level when it comes to having conversation and conversing about such things, things that often aren't the things we agree upon. 
Father, help us to seek the truth. Don't let that stop, but help us to seek it in a way that's not in a way that tears others down. Father, you're the mo- your son is the model for us, and um, we hope that your spirit can continue to shape and mold us to what he has modeled and what he teaches us and calls us into. Father, it's by the power of your spirit and through your son Jesus that we pray this. Amen. morning. Uh, just so you know, um, we're not going to be having the offering basket passed around, but you can see there's, there's one here and one over here, and there's also opportunities for you to give online. Um, so please uh, keep that in mind as you go out today. Uh, I guess today's the day of reading Old Testament passages that might be a little obscure to people. Larry read one from Ezra earlier. I want to look at one, if you have a Bible with you, it might be handy to to flip to Exodus 24, and I'm going to look at the first eight verses there for our communion time this morning. Uh, It says, uh, then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship at a distance. Moses alone shall come near the Lord. But the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and set up twelve pillars corresponding to the twelve tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen as offering of well-being to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he dashed on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. Moses took the blood and dashed it on the people and said, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. This text in Exodus serves as a transition from the previous few chapters, which are known sometimes as the book of the covenant, And this section here where the people accept uh, God's covenant with Israel. This passage here in Exodus 24 begins with Moses, Aaron, and Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, going up on the mountain, and Moses coming and being in the presence of the Lord. Moses then goes, in verse 3, goes down the mountain and informs the people what he received from the Lord. And the people respond, all the words that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses then writes down those words that he just received from the Lord. And he builds an altar and then puts 12 pillars by it. The altar there symbolizes God and the 12 pillars symbolize the 12 tribes of Israel. And then Moses performs a ceremony, a ceremony that... So it says there he has some of the young men uh, perform some burnt offerings. Half the blood is poured on the altar. And then he, he again reads the book of the covenant that he just wrote down. The people again affirm the covenant the Lord has spoken, we will do. So we see that they say that twice in this passage. And then Moses does something that might gross us out a little bit. He takes the, the, the other half of the blood that wasn't poured on the altar and he dumps it on the people. And he says, See the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So God and the people are joined together in a kind of blood bond. You know, half of the blood was poured on the altar that symbolizes God. The other half was poured on the people. 
and this blood joined them together in a covenant. And then interestingly, a few verses later in verse 11, it says that some of the people go up before the Lord and they beheld God and they ate and drank. So we also see a covenant meal joined together with this ceremony that joins God and the people together in this covenant. Now you might be wondering why I'm talking about this passage. Uh, You know, what does that have to do with communion? Well, scholars often point out that there's a clear parallel between this passage in Exodus 24 and the accounts of the Last Supper in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as well as 1 Corinthians. Let's see if you can hear it as I read the words of institution from 1 Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as Moses said in Exodus 24, see the blood of the covenant, Jesus here in the upper room with his disciples says that this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That the blood in the cup, the blood that Jesus poured out on the cross for us, is the covenant that binds us, that reconciles us with God in the same way that the blood that Moses used in Exodus 24 joined Israel and God together in a covenant. And just as they then shared in a covenant meal in Exodus 24, so Jesus says this in the context of a covenant meal that points to Jesus' blood, the blood that's shed that forgives us of our sins, that binds us together with God, that calls us to love and serve God and our neighbor. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for this supper by which we proclaim here the death of Christ until he comes. We thank you for those who have gone before us that have shared in this meal of reflection and proclamation. We thank you for those who come after us who will join in this same meal. We take our place today declaring with faith that Jesus, whom we remember in the bread and in the cup, died for us and rose again. Bless this loaf, the body of Christ given for us. Bless the cup, the blood of the new covenant. Bless your people, the body of Christ assembled here in his name. Until he comes, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'm already ingrained to tell you to all be seated, but you've already been seated, so no reason to do that. <laughs> no laughs on that one at all? Okay, never mind. Uh, as we leave, I just want to point your attention to a couple of things. We're going to try this format of worship for the next few weeks, uh, so right now that's the plan. Straight away, straight away for next week, uh, fixed for next week. But yeah, the plan is to do this in here for the next few weeks. Um, as things adjust, we'll try to let you know um, in that fashion. One other thing we want to point your attention to is um, Mike has been engaged with a group of uh, pastors and ministers from all of Western New York, um, city churches and suburban churches to um, kind of work toward a way how can how can those churches come together to kind of be a unifying uh, group of people amidst all the, the craziness going on often impact city churches differently than they do suburban churches. And so a way for, for those churches to come together are a set of um, neighborhood activities and a worship experience on Saturdays coming up over the next many weeks. Uh, July 11th is the first one, July 18th, July 25th, August 1st, and then on August 8th, there's also a concert. Uh, there's some sheets on the tables as you leave if you would like to pick up a sheet with some more information. Basically, it's just a way, aren't as aware, aren't as engaged in some of those things that are going on there. And it's also just a way for us to worship together uh, with brothers and sisters that live in just a different environment than, than sometimes we do in a city with... Um, crime and just other things around them that, that we maybe often don't experience, but a way to kind of have unity in this crazy time that we live in. So that's next week. And may he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors, hopefully next week. Go in peace. Glad you're here. Feel free to fellowship outside and chat and catch up with each other. We're glad you're here.